Coming up. I grew up in a, a rough part of Jamaica, Mountain View. He said, by the way, um, were you interested in coaching Jamaica? And I'm like, nah, 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 nah. I don't, I don't want to have to deal with the JFF. And I got another phone call and it was Sadella Marley. Hey everyone, this week on The Trailblazers, we have legendary football coach Hugh Menzies, who is known for his phenomenal work as a coach. He's also the person behind the historic rise of Jamaica's reggae girls and their 2019 FIFA World Cup qualification. From working on Wall Street to going into coaching, starting over your career at any age, his tips on that and his rules for success. Stay tuned. Special thanks to our sponsors, Stars Publicity, for all your PR and publicity needs. Get noticed and align with the stars. DG's Health and Wellness Center for weight loss, weight gain, and other healthy lifestyle needs. Book a consultation today. And Kaoris Beauty for all your skincare needs, including the best products to fight acne and more. Get 5% off all purchases using the discount code TAMARA5OFF. More details on all these packages listed in the YouTube description. What's your word to them? I would say to fight. Fight for your dreams. Fight for your purpose. The life that inspires you. That motive that you aspire to be. Right? Uh, in my humble opinion, is become very comfortable with yourself. Very important. You know, the saying in Jamaica, one hand can't clap. You forgive yourself for allowing people to mistreat you. Disciplines that we need to embody. You just have to work at it and be committed to everyone. And it's scary to have all of that fall away from you. And you have to celebrate those wins. Work with Christ. fitness clients. For guidance, rely on Christ for support. And no rush. I did it. I, I made my move into entrepreneurship at 40. Um, so chicken, so scared. That when what, you know, last comments would you want to share with you? You have your core values. You do the right things. It'll fall in place for you. Menzies is a legendary football coach who has over 38 years coaching experience. He was the Reggae Girls Jamaican Women's National Team Head Coach and a major force in creating their historic qualification to the FIFA Women's World Cup, the first ever Caribbean nation to do so. Currently, he is the Executive Director of Central Florida Craze, Crush, and one of the founders and directors for the Lone Star Soccer Association in Austin, Texas. He has received many awards and accolades, including the CONCACAF Women's Football Coach of the Year 2018 and more. Hugh, prior to migrating, once lived in the inner city community of Mountain View in Jamaica. This trailblazer who worked on Wall Street for several years shares more in this episode. Hi Hugh, it is a pleasure to have you joining us on the Trailblazers and I understand you're all the way in Florida. Yes, we are. It's a little bit cool today, so, um, but I'm um, enjoying the weather here. It's not as hot as it, it will be in the next couple of days. I know. Well, um, it is a pleasure to have you, and no doubt you have accomplished quite a lot. I mean, you are the person who is behind the reggae girls making it to World Cup. And so we have quite a bit to discuss here today, so welcome. Thank you, thanks for having me. All right, so let's get started. I mean, you are known as a phenomenal coach. You've been in the business for 38 years, almost 40 years. So, I mean, you have accomplished quite a lot in your career. Tell us about your journey. How did you get started? Was it always your passion to go into that area? Obviously, um, you know, I was I played football in Jamaica. I wasn't that great, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I also I played at good teams in Jamaica, but I was one of the lower lower players. And then I migrated in 1980 to to um, to the U.S. I was more of a cricket player than a footballer, anyway. But um, as you know, cricket is non-existent here in the United States. So you know. I, I needed to get my um, college paid for, so I decided to focus a little bit on football because I thought football would give me the avenue. I was fortunate enough to get on a, a very good team in Houston, Texas, 
And um, we we made it pretty far, got the exposure that I needed to, and then end up getting a scholarship and um, playing football um, four years in college and then then got drafted to the professional league, which is in Houston. Houston Dynamos went there um, for a year, a year. My mom got sick, so she was in Orlando. So I forced a trade to come to Orlando and um, kind of spent some time with her back in, that was in 1987. And then we, play, we, we played a, a half a season there, got injured and got into, my mom started getting better and then I got into um, grad school um, in New York. So took off to New York, um, ended up going to grad school, end up um, working for Merrill Lynch. Um, spent some time on, the, on Wall Street. Um, Let's stick up in there because that's kind of interesting because all along the trajectory, you were more into sports. Right, right. But you know, you know when, you, when you realize you got to take care of your parents, so, yeah, and, and the money back then wasn't flowing much in the league back then as it is now. Okay, so that is why you decided to go to Wall Street. Yeah, that's why, I, yeah, I try to see what can... Um, okay, so what was your experience like, you know, working on, you know, Wall Street for like, what, seven well, years? You know, you know, some people say, would you do it over, you know, change your journey? Um, and I would never change my journey. I thought I learned a lot about just dealing with people at a higher level. I wasn't the most political person on Wall Street, so... so um, because, you know, I was one of those persons I tell you like it is and still am. Um, however, I learned a lot just from a business standpoint and a professional standpoint, um, you know, how to run a business. I was, you know, obviously my family has been very involved with, with accounting and finance. And um, you know, I know you had an interview with Dennis Chung, he's my cousin, so first cousin so um so we're, our, our family is more in tune to business but i was kind of the odd person always on the streets playing football or cricket or whatever but just floated right back into business you know because that's what we all grew up on doing so um you know merrill lynch gave me the opportunity that paid for my school so which was which was awesome and then yeah, that's awesome um, and then you know got promoted um and I, again, when you're at Merrill Lynch, it's, it's, we call it 25-8, you know, it's eight days a week, 25 hours a day. So you grind for the first five years. Um, they call it the Merrill way. So we, um, you know, I was all over the world um, traveling and I worked in a, I didn't do actual stocks. I worked for their telecom finance department, which we audited all their utility bills, uh, obviously. And, um, and then obviously we go back and negotiate with the various vendors, whether we overpaid or they owe us money, whatever. So that was my job. Um, so at what point then did you decide that, okay, you've had enough of Wall Street, you're going back to what you're passionate and what you love? Well, you know, you know, sometimes you're getting a job and you're, you start realizing that, you know, you know, what you really are here on this earth to do, you know, you start, you know, is it a money thing? It's a, is it to give back? And to be honest with you, I was helped tremendously as a kid um, growing up and, you know, not by my immediate parents, but obviously my mom was the key factor, but I didn't really grow up with a father. So, so my coach was always the person there for me. And um, so as I got older and a little bit wiser, you try to figure out what's your niche. And um, and I felt I needed to give back to to society. I felt like I was doing a lot of working with the Boys and Girls Club in New York, and and I, it just felt good about you know every time I leave there, I wanted to be there. Um, not saying I didn't want to go to work, but you know at some time, point in time, I realized that this is my calling, you know, to give back. So um, I went cold turkey. Um, Really? Yeah. I yeah my, my, well, you know, I I took a vacation back to where my school was in Texas, just to kind of see everybody. I haven't seen everybody at the time, and 
and a, a friend of mine was the head coach of a high school there. And um, he was leaving. He was going on a, doing a mission um, program that he was involved with in Africa. So he was leaving. And when I was in college, I started a coach just to make a little side money at the time. And the guy that was running the team became the school board director of the school system. And um, so we've always kept in touch. I made a big impact on his own, his kid. And um, so he invited me down for vacation and um, he just blurted out, yeah, can you come in and coach, replace Randy? I said, you kidding me? I mean, from a salary point of view, <laughs> I mean, I'm making, you know, 20 times the amount of money you're going to do as a teacher at the time. Um, so I fly, I flew back to New York to start working, and somebody just teed me off in, in, in the job. And, um, you know, I told him, I said, you know what, I think it's time for me to take a two-week hiatus. And then, and then I, was in, I was really involved with a lot of projects. So basically, I told them what you could do is just mail down, I mail my computer down to Texas, and I'll finish up what I need to finish up. But I had to go back to school to get an education degree. Yes. I got that degree, and then became a math teacher. Yeah, you became a math teacher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah. Is total shift. Mm -hmm. So. Did that, and obviously, math teachers are in high demand all the time. So, so I became a math teacher, and then um, and also coach because I, I made this whole transition. You know, everybody thought Wall Street. I've made it big in Wall Street, but you know, you know, I mean, everything was great. I, and I, again, I'm not gonna say I'll do something different, but Merrill Lynch was good to me, and uh, they got my degree. I handed it to my mom. Um, which is what she wanted to see. But at um, the end of the day, I wanted to give back and help help kids. And, and I, really, I really have to, you know, stick at that point as well, because for so many people, they get caught up sometimes in the money and not necessarily something that they love or what they're passionate about. Not to say the money is not important. It's very important. You, mentioned you did that for, you know, several years. But it is also crucial that whatever you're doing, as you earlier mentioned, what am I here on earth for? What's my calling and my purpose that you love it, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, I figured, you know, I'm, I was going to figure this thing out to make sure that I put myself in a comfortable position where I can help my mom yes. and myself. So I did high school for four years, got involved with the, Olympic development program, which is the U.S. in the U.S., they they brought me in, and and um, I, I I did fairly well as a coach, um, and ran into a good buddy of mine um, that I played with back in the day. Um, he asked me to come to University of Texas in Austin, um, a women's program. Never coached women before. Um, you know, where I was in West Texas at the time the women's football was not very good. <laughs> so so I just have this perception. So he asked me to come to a summer camp, went to Austin. Austin's a great city, beautiful city. Um, and, I re and I saw these, these um, kids playing girls. Uh, there were women at the time, they were in college, and I was shocked. I was like, these kids can play. Yes. Um, never, been, never been around females playing football. So I got involved, you know, decided to leave um, high school, went to University of Texas, which, you know, Texas is a massive school, um, you know, 60,000 kids. And, wow. Um, you know, the budget, uh, the budget there, the football budget there was unbelievable. So, but it was a great, great environment um, as far as coaching and a good, I was the assistant coach. Um, Dang Piblovich was a head coach at the time, and I learned uh, so much from him, just from a teaching standpoint. I uh, owe a lot to him as far as my um, soccer knowledge. Fast forward to when, no, because you grew up in Jamaica mm -hmm. and then migrated, right? Yeah, I was born in England, really, but I went to Jamaica when I was a little kid, um, oh. four years old. 
when you were four years old. Yeah, yeah. Mom is Jamaican. Mom's Jamaican, dad's Jamaican, but you know the the Windrush program back in the oh in yes fifties, everybody migrated, and yeah, so my parents was part of that. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So having uh, grown in Jamaica and had that Jamaican experience, then was it always your desire? Because I want to know at what point now did you know get involved with the reggae girls? Well, you know, I I I did very well. Uh, you know, after leaving Texas, I started a club in Texas, which is now one of the largest clubs in the country, Lone Star. Um, started from scratch, and and um, I know it's about seven thousand kids now. So, but um, you know, that was that's a business. That that is a that's it's also a youth club, but it's a business, and we run it like a business because here. It's a pay to play model. So the parents pay and so you have to run the business. Fa fast forward in all the way to back into Orlando. Um my mom got sick again. And um so, you know, I'm, I, my club at the time was ranked very high in the country and I had to make a decision and it was it wasn't much of a decision to be honest with you cuz I spent a lot of time building that club in in Texas. But I moved. I moved here to take care of moms in um, in um, 2009. So I started over from scratch again here wow. in uh, Orlando, um, and then started to build my name back in in Florida, and then um, involved with the U.S. national team um, women's program, um, and then I, and then I got a phone call from a high school buddy of mine um, back in Jamaica. He said, um, you know, he was living in Fort Lauderdale at the time. And he said, you know, my daughter wants to play for Jamaica. And I said, okay. Um, he said, by the way, um, were you interested in coaching Jamaica? And I'm like, nah, 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 nah. I don't, I don't wanna have to deal with the JFF. <laughs> You know, because we hear all these stories, and and um, and you know, was captain at the time, um, and I and I and I got another phone call, and it was Sedella Marley. Sedella, I just got, I, I was named, you know, youth youth football coach of the year in the states. So, uh, I just I got a call from her, and she said, "Coach, can I come up and visit you?" And I said. No, no need to, because she lives in Pinecrest, and because um, I'm coming down there because I had games. So when I come down, I can, I'll stay, spend an extra night, and we can meet. And we met at a mall. I don't remember an Italian restaurant. And if you know Sedella, Sedella is a sharp, sharp individual, um, very business liked, um, and and um, definitely a body profile person. She reads you up and down, and when when you when you work for Maryland, you you go through a school called the Merrill Merrill School in Chicago, and they teach you how to body profile because when you're doing business, you know you're dealing with the Japanese, the very stoic people. So you got to know how the ears or the ears, the eye. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 it stuck with me for a while, and um, and uh, she was doing the same thing to me. I was doing the same thing to her. And we just bust out laughing, you know. So, but you know, it kind of, you know, meeting such an icon, you know, and and, and I've coached uh, Presidents Bush kids. I've coached some very top level people, executives, and so forth. And uh, but you know, Sedella gave me was a, it was like, you know, when I was a kid, I met Bob Marley up in uh, Mona, and um, and he made a big impact, you know, because. You know, he doesn't speak regular English. <laughs> it's all proverbs, you know. So you 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 always remember what he would, would say, you know. So when I met her, it was like seeing him again, you know. Wow. And, uh, and then she said to me that I want you to come help us, but you know you can, you don't have to be the head coach at the time because we already have a head coach. But we want to bring the team up to you to Orlando because they're getting ready to do the qualifiers. And, and and wanted me to host them, and but they didn't have much money, 
you know? And so I said, don't worry. I might, you know, I'll, we'll take care of the team. So we brought him up with, um, Marin Gordon was the coach at the time. And, um, you know, so they came up and, and I tell you what, um, they didn't have everything. They didn't have, the kids didn't have the equipment. So I called my friend up, Lauren Donaldson up in Colorado, who is, who grew up in my neighborhood. Um, in, in Mountain View and um, we um, we called around and in, in two days we had 50 pairs of shoes wow. you know, sports bras you name it we had everything Amazing. So we it out to them and then I start realizing this is my call you know what I mean this is I need this is an opportunity to give back to my country and then, you know, obviously they went through the qualifiers. They didn't qualify. We end up being fairly involved at the time because um, obviously they had a head coach. And then January, um, the captain called me and he said, Hugo, you want to take over this program? <laughs> it's just very, very stoic. <laughs> and I said to him, I'm like, I have to know exactly because I'm a business guy. Everything has to be in front of me. I have to know, make a conscious decision. Um, so I went down to Jamaica and nothing was <laughs> nothing was prepared. And I told him, I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this on my own terms because you guys seem like you're in left field. You're not you're not progressing with the women's program. Um, being here in the states. The women's program number one in the world. So you're around, you see success of women's football, and it's what fo women's football can do for players. It's not just playing on the field, but what they can do for themselves. Um, you know, beyond. That's so football. amazing. Yeah. So, so you 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 have this in your. I have this in my mind that these guys have no idea. You know what 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 um what they can do for the young ladies in Jamaica. So, so we decided to take the job and, um, and I started hiring my staff. Awesome. The only thing is there was no money. Oh, wow. <laughs> there's, there's no money, but you have work to do. So how do you do it? But again, money is important, but I put myself in a position at my job here that I have good people and we have a business here that we can run. So I told him, I came back and told my staff, I said, let me tell you something, we're gonna do this thing for four years and um, we're gonna see if we can make the next World Cup. Wow. And, um, we're gonna, we're gonna just give me some time. You take up the slack when I leave because our business is like a machine here. You know, we have 2000 kids and you know, I got a hundred and something coaches. So, so everything runs pretty smooth here. Okay, so you uh, are you know to spend some time to devote to the team. All right, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move things along just mm -hmm. because of the time length of the program. But uh, what I wanted to find out for you is what did you do differently? What do you think you did differently that enabled the girls to, you know, to reach the World Cup? Well, first thing, we had to change the mindset of our female athletes in Jamaica because I think there were, there were few kids that are very good players, but they were treated like queens and not wanted to push them through adversity. And so what we did was we, we got rid of a lot of players and we went young. Um, I was probably the most hated person in Jamaica at the time because some of the top players we got rid of. And But anyway, we changed the mindset. Um, obviously, we always say in Jamaica we have unbelievable athletes. Yes. All right? In America, you have we have okay athletes, but we have to teach them football, right, and be an athlete. In Jamaica, all you have to do is teach the football, you know, because they're already athletes. So, but we had to change the mindset. So we, we introduced testing, fitness testing. And if you don't pass, you don't play. That was, that was my motto. And that just eliminated a bunch of those players. 
So we felt like we had to hit the diaspora and try to go out there and find, find Jamaicans that are abroad, that are involved in the system. And we did. And we brought in, and we took the good younger players in Jamaica and brought them overseas to put them in schools um, and put them into a system where football was there. And, but the biggest thing for me was every kid had to get their education. Um, it was it was a plus for me. I think I think it's so easy to coach people that are educated, so to speak. They they have a learning capacity, yes. and um, and you know, so it's it's a lot easier to get to them mm -hmm. and let them understand what you're doing. So so we 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 assemble a team, um, and then the 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 program went dormant. What? <laughs> They called me and said, we're done. We're not doing anything. So I continued my course because I knew that um, the F FIFA was going to come back to Jamaica and say, hey, we have World Cup qualifiers. Because, you, you know, obviously they give JFF money for women's programs, so they're going to have to end up spending it. Um, they have to show they're spending it on women's programs. So... So two years after that, we, we, we assembled a group. We, we have them playing in colleges. We have them playing in Europe. And we just went for the phone call. And it's, it happened February um, that year. Hold on. So the program went dormant, but you're still dormant. you okay. personally doing your thing. And you're also waiting on that phone call. So you talk about faith. Yeah. So we got the phone call. We had to go to Haiti. Um, because I don't know why we're in with Haiti, because we were probably the two, two top teams in the Caribbean at the time. But we had to go there. We end up, you know, you know, fast forward and everything, we end up getting through. Finally got a chance to play in Jamaica, because Jamaica, you know, they've never played women's football for, like, apparently 12 years in the National Stadium. And I, wow. and I, and I, 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 I mean, I made a lot of noise that we needed to host the Caribbean Cup in Jamaica. We need Jamaica to see yeah. what our team's about. And we did. We came. First game with Stadium Grandstand was, like, empty. We won that game very easy. The next game, a little by probably 20% of Grandstand. Mm -hmm. The third game, we played Trinidad, a la Grandstand Park. Wow. And then the last game, Cuba, we beat Cuba pretty handily. And then we went off to CONCACAF qualifier in, in Texas. Obviously, the, we, we got through um, a lot of adversity there with the JFF, but we don't, we don't need to get into that. But, you know, we took it up on ourselves that this was a project that we wanted to fulfill. So one of the things I, I wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. uh, because I have a few other questions to ask, but the time is, is going so quickly. Yeah, one go ahead. Thing I want to ask you is, how did you feel when the girls finally know qualified for the World Cup after all the work um, that you personally put in and sacrificing even getting certain money and, you know, the sweat and the dedication? Well, the, to tell you that honest truth, um, the people ask me this, the media ask me this, the World Cup wasn't the ultimate goal. Oh. Um, it was... It was mm, Women empowerment in Jamaica was the ultimate goal. Oh, wow. Uh, make people realize that women are strong people. Yeah. I grew up with a mom, so I'm, I'm a mama's boy. So, um, and I think that, you know, people in Jamaica tend to feel, to understand the, the mind of a woman, you know, how strong it is, yes. how strong that individual can be. And that was the, you know, that was the ultimate goal for me. The World Cup was just part of that journey. And it, um, so when it happened, I was, no doubt, we were in ecstatic because we created history. Yes. First Caribbean country to qualify for the big show. And, and um, you know, it just put us on another pedestal. Um, you know, our players now are going to get what they need, you know, as far as being professionals and, and move on in their careers and so forth. But the end, the end of the day, it, this was bigger than football when we took this on. So, and yeah. um, you are certainly right about that. That the goal 
that you set forward in terms of women empowerment and having people have that perception of women just being great and mm. anything you definitely achieve that i want to zoom in now just a little bit more personal because you are not only an executive coach and accomplished one at that as, as well as a businessman but you speak highly of your mother and to me that she seems as if she's your inspiration because throughout your career as you shared with us you literally moved jobs and she and started over because of her so how important is it for persons to have that source of inspiration to push them forward no matter their journey yeah you know you you again i didn't grow up with a father really so my mom was my dad and my mom so and um so she was definitely she would work tireless just to make sure that we have food on the table we we grew up i grew up in a the rough part of Jamaica, Mountain View, but I can tell people this, that we were never hungry. We were never, you know, we, my mom made sure everything was there for us. Um, so, you know, when you see that, you know, come home 10 o'clock at night, you meet her at the bus stop, walk her, but you know what I mean? You, you kind of like realize that this is a strong individual that wants the best for or, or kids. And, uh, oh, and, um, it's interesting that you said that because I did not know that. And coming into this interview, I actually thought that you perhaps had a well-off or a well-to-do yeah. journey. So yeah. I had no idea you even grow we, up. We, we had a, my, my family was very big, you know. Um, um, Dennis's dad, Uncle Kenneth was the oldest. My mom was the second. There's nine of them. Um, two just passed. Dennis, dad, Dennis, father passed and um and then my other aunt which is another strong woman passed but the chung family as it's known um the women run things <laughs> so um and you know we they all went their separate ways my mom was unfortunate she had some illness so you know we kind of just took a different route you know some of them went a different route and you know, very successful in what they're doing. I think my mom had her own success. And I thought, um, you know, I felt like I needed to give back to her. Yes. You know, the things that she worked so hard to put put me through. And to this day, you know, she, she had COVID for 40 days and she got through it. Yes. Um, she's still alive and breathing. I go what, see her at least twice a week at the facility. And... Um, it's it's definitely inspiration yeah, and you are no doubt that and we are winding down but one of the things i want to touch on is that so many people feel like they may be in a career or they're on a particular path and maybe they're not living up to their true potential or passion but yet they for whatever reason are afraid to start over again yet you are the embodiment of starting over so many different times so what would you want to say to them you know, you gotta, you gotta, you have a journey. You, you come on this earth for a purpose. And sometimes you have to go through different paths to get to that purpose. And it's, it's not where you start is where you end. And um, it's, it's, it's important that you, you live a honest life. <laughs> you, you have passion for what you believe in and you gotta be strong. You gotta be strong and and um, committed to to the cause and and as you go through life, you know exactly. You start realizing what you're here for, and the people that um, have kind of paved your path. You have to, you know, you're part of their mold. You know, so I can honestly say, my coach, my mom, my, my aunts. I have some aunts that are very good business people. And so they paved they paved that path for me, and and you know what? And again, you just gotta really realize what you hear for, and it'll hit you. Yeah. It, it just hit me earlier than probably than a lot of people, but I realized that money was important, but you gotta come home and sleep at night and get up and go. I love that that 
is so true, so real. All right, so my final question to you, Hugh. We definitely need a part two. Um, <laughs> that's such a tremendous story, but my yeah. final question to you, which we normally end with, is just to get some words of advice for our aspiring trailblazers as they go forth in their own lives and in their own journey. Don't let nobody knock you off the track that you feel like you need to be on, um, you know, because people are going to push you up, push you off that, try to push you off that track. And, and again, it's not where you start, it's where you end. And you have to go through adversity to get what you need, because if you don't, it don't worth anything. So um, I tell people is that, you know, it took me to get to this point. People come and visit my club and they're like, oh, this is great. But that's a, that's a lot of years of creating that path. And, and again, if you don't have any adversity, it doesn't work anything. So take the rocky road. And um, the sooner you do that in life, the better off you're going to be at the end awesome i am so happy that you were able to share on the trailblazers and no doubt you are truly a phenomenal trailblazer in your career in your work and at life and we just encourage you and applaud you for all that you are doing and just continue to blaze your trail and to inspire millions of lives thank you so much you're welcome and i really appreciate what you're doing it's just so inspiring to see that people in Jamaica that are really making it and making a difference and and for your show it kind of spreads that word so thank you thank you so much I appreciate that and we certainly will be doing this again all right good take all care right. of yourself thank you hey everyone I am Tamara McHale television presenter producer and communication specialist and of course producer and host of the trailblazer series I'm inviting you to join the family all you have to do is just hit that notification bell click the subscribe button below and then join us weekly for inspirational episodes that will lift your spirits and give you that motivation and drive to keep blazing your trail